That was, one might call that tepid. Good morning. Today is the day the Lord has made. So good to see everybody today. Oh boy, if, if you were not here at 8.30, uh, you got to stay for 11. Uh, I list that sermon. Oh, Simon, it's so good to have you. And I'm not going to just parrot all the things I've read, written in the bulletin before you, you, you I've said that. But um, just to remind everybody that we've been at a conference down in Charleston and Simon may want to say something about that, but uh, we were just so blessed to be able to see doors open to, a, to the wardrobe that we are here in this place uh, for, for him to be here, and just, just so excited to hear from him. Um, I'm, do, I, I'm so glad uh, to, to be able to say that this is being recorded. One of the things I was struck by again is that Simon does not speak American. We love him anyway, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's like, gosh, I got to recalibrate my ear a little bit. Um, beautiful Oxford accent and all, but I say that because uh, I know I want to go back and savor all the things that he is bringing us over, over this day. So um, uh, it is so good to be together and uh, we can't do better than to go to the Lord uh, in prayer, and I want to pray for us being together right now. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for waking us again in the morning, giving us breath. We wait upon you. Oh, we watch and we wait with expectancy to see how you'll take our lives this day, not as we want necessarily to be or, or as, as we're not, but just exactly as we are, that you would meet us in grace and the power of your spirit would come and, and be in our fellowship and most particularly be with Simon as, as he opens his own heart to the beauty and the truth of your word and brings that to us. Thank you that he's agreed to come up here and spend the day with us. Um, I pray, as we all pray, consciously or not, that as we walk out and the way that you choose, we will be different from having met with you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Simon, welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, John, for that introduction. Uh, it's great to see you all here. <laughs> he says I can't speak American. <laughs> So, as John said, we've just been at the Mere Anglicanism Conference, and I wanted to share with you something that I spoke about there. But my brief at that conference was to talk about what we can learn from the Narnia stories, about the importance of a beautiful story in sharing our faith. And I think Lewis really gives us lots of opportunities in, in his wonderful Narnia stories to do that. And so I just want to think about a particular example that he gives us. And he explained his approach to writing a Christian story to an American author and publisher who'd written to him for advice in August of 1954. And he began by stressing that the importance is initially on making an engaging narrative. So he says the first business of a story is to be a good story. When our Lord made a wheel in the carpenter shop, depend upon it, it was first and foremost a good wheel. I'm not quite sure about the historical accuracy of that latter part, but I get what he's trying to say is that first thing we need to do is make sure the story is one that draws the reader in. And he's, he warns her against trying to shoehorn in the Christian elements. He says, let them come to the surface of their own accord. And if they choose not to, well, you're still left with a story that will give pleasure and nourishment. So the Narnia stories were first and foremost attempts to engage and entertain his readers. But at the same time, they set out to circumvent a problem that Lewis had experienced himself when he was a child. Remember, he was an atheist before he came to faith later on in his life. And the real problem, he thought, was that it was very difficult to feel how he was told he ought to feel about God or about the sufferings of Christ. He thought it was the very obligation that froze his feelings. And in Narnia, he said what he wanted to do was to take the gospel story, 
strip it of what he called its Sunday school stained glass associations, the ones that we're used to seeing around us all the time and become so familiar that they don't really engage us. And he wanted to make it appear as fresh and powerful as if we'd heard it for the very first time. And he says, could we not steal past those watchful dragons? I thought one could. The watchful dragons, the things in society and ourselves that stop us experiencing the gospel in a fresh and new way. But isn't that something we can all relate to? How often when we want to share the good news with someone who's heard it many times before, often when they were a child in Sunday school and perhaps not very exciting or engagingly, we want to find a powerful new way of communicating with them. So I want to give you a couple of examples of how the Narnia stories help us do that. And I want to focus on two aspects of the Christian faith central to that process sin and salvation. How do we help our non-Christian friends understand the concepts of sinfulness and the need for salvation in a society where those ideas seem increasingly foreign, outdated, and outmoded? How do we steal past the watchful dragons of our own 21st century world? The choice of metaphor that Lewis uses here I find really interesting, the watchful dragon, because what is it that a watchful dragon is watching? What are we trying to steal past the dragon to get hold of? Well, treasure, obviously. And there's a nice moment in the voyage of the Dawn Treader where we look very directly at this theme. It's that chapter that's evocatively titled Dragon Island, if you remember that, where the Dawn Treader turns up at an island. Uh, they've they need to stop off at the island because the ship has been badly damaged in a storm. And when they stop there, they start trying to mend the ship and um, engage in very necessary repair work. But Eustace Scrub, who's the one who, the odious cousin, remember Eustace Clarence Scrub? Uh, he almost deserved his name. Uh, he's so unpleasant. And uh, he sets off on his own because he's not willing to help out. He's on the journey completely against his will. And um, he sets off, uh, finds himself as he climbs up a mountain outside a cave. And at the entrance to the cave, he sees two thin wisps of smoke accompanied by the sound of loose stones moving as if something were crawling over them. And I'm just going to read you a bit to remind you what happens next. Something was crawling. Worse still, something was coming out. Edmund, or Lucy, or you, would have recognized it at once. But Eustace had read none of the right books. The thing that came out of the cave was something he had never even imagined. A long, lead-colored snout. Dull, red eyes. No feathers or fur a long, lithe body that trailed on the ground, legs whose elbows went up higher than its back like a spider's, cruel claws, bat's wings that made a rasping noise on the stones, yards of tail, and the two lines of smoke were coming from its nostrils. He never said the word dragon to himself, nor would it have made things any better if he had. But perhaps if he had known something about dragons, he would have been a little surprised at this dragon's behavior. It did not sit up and clap its wings, nor did it shoot out a stream of flame from its mouth. The smoke from its nostrils was like the smoke of a fire that will not last much longer. Nor did it seem to have noticed Eustace. It moved very slowly towards the pool, slowly and with many pauses. Even in his fear, Eustace felt that it was an odd old, sad creature. He wondered if he dared make a dash for the ascent, but it might look round if he made any noise and might come to life. Perhaps it was only shamming. Anyway, what was the use of trying to escape by climbing from a creature that could fly? But at this moment, just when we think we're going to have an exciting encounter between Eustace and a dragon, the dragon just drops down dead. And then it starts to rain and Eustace takes shelter in the cave. Now, a bit more from the book. 
Most of us know what would, we would expect in a dragon's lair. But, as I said before, Eustace had read only the wrong books. They had a lot to say about exports and imports, governments and drains, but they were weak on dragons. That is why he was so puzzled at the surface on which he was lying. Parts of it were too prickly to be stones and too hard to be thorns, and there seemed to be a great many round, flat things, and it all clinked when he moved. There was light enough at the cave's mouth to examine it by, and of course, Eustace found it to be what any of us could have told him in advance, treasure. There were crowns, those were the prickly things, coins, rings, bracelets, ingots, cups, plates, and gems. So the narrator here is very keen to highlight how Eustace and his reading had left him ill-prepared for dealing with the dragon. He'd wasted his time reading information books. But what should he have been reading so that he could have known that dragons are usually to be found sitting on treasure troves? Well, one obvious source would be the Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf, in which the hero, having dispatched the monstrous Grendel, and then even more terrifyingly, Grendel's mother, finds himself up against a dragon sitting on a mavum hoard. That's the old English word for a treasure hoard. And Lewis himself read that poem first in 1916 when he was 18. And he loved it for its atmosphere of terror and the sense of a world where most of it was dense forest and at any moment a demon might appear and drag you off to its lair. But if even a precocious young reader like Lewis only first read that poem when he was 18 and was terrified by it, it seems like it wouldn't be really the right thing to expect Eustace to have read. But there's another work that he could have read, uh, but again, this one is even more specialist. It's the Norse saga of the Volsungs. This is a work that also enchanted the young J.R.R. Tolkien. And it's particularly relevant here because in the story, which involves a huge treasure trove, which a young Fafnir takes away into a forest because he doesn't want to share it with any of his brothers, and he sits and guards it all day long. And because of his greed and because of his desire for the treasure, he turns into a dragon. Lewis knew this as well through um, Wagner's Ring Cycle, which again tells the same story, um, and which he was enchanted with, and particularly with the illustrations that Arthur Rackham provided for it. It was one of the things, seeing those illustrations for the first time, is what Lewis in Surprised by Joy says, it was filled him with a desire for northernness. And he talks about cycling around the Wicklow Mountains as a child, going past little caves and wondering if at any moment Fafnir might crawl out. Now that story would obviously have been a very, very valuable precautionary tale for Eustace because, of course, it is a direct consequence of Eustace falling asleep in that cave on top of that treasure trove on which the dragon has sat with greedy, dragonish thoughts in his mind that he himself is turned into a dragon. You remember, he wakes up and, and he, he can see, sort of lifts his arm, and he sees this dragon uh, next to him, but it turns out, of course, he is the dragon. Another possible source, of course, given that we could, probably can't expect Eustace to have read either Volsunga Saga or Beowulf, would be The Hobbit, uh, written by J.R.R. Tolkien, and based largely upon Beowulf, if you remember, when uh, there's that great scene in which Bilbo has to tiptoe into the Smaug's lair uh, to try and steal the Arkenstone. Um, so he's there really exactly doing this, tiptoeing past those watchful dragons, although he's cheating a bit because, of course, he's wearing the one ring, which makes him invisible. Uh, it's a bit easier to do it if you're invisible. I still wouldn't fancy it myself. But we also get the association here between um, a dragon's hoard and the greed that goes with it. You remember Thorin, when they finally get hold of the treasure. Thorin, we're told, spends a lot of time in the treasury and the lust for the gold weighs heavily on his heart. And as a result, he doesn't want to share the treasure with others. 
He didn't, Bilbo thinks and hopes that Thorin is going to be fair, but he did not reckon with the power that gold has upon which a dragon has long brooded. So Eustace could have learned something from that, the, the powerful adverse effects of a dragon's hoard. Now you might be thinking I'm taking this all a bit literally, since after all, Eustace is a, fic a fictional character, and so you can't really read The Hobbit anyway. Um, but I've, I find the comparison with Tolkien's work a useful one because it points out a difference in approach to the use of dragons and their hordes in these two works. Both authors were fascinated with dragons, of course. Tolkien says, as a child, he didn't really want to meet a dragon, but he did like the idea of a world that contained even the imagination of Fafnir. It was richer and more beautiful but they treat them very differently. Tolkien, the year before he published The Hobbit in 1936, gave a lecture to the British Academy, and it was called Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics. And in it, he objected to the way that dragons are conventionally treated as allegories representing greed. And he tries to make a distinction between what he calls a draco, which is the Latin word for a dragon, um, which is a true, proper depiction of a dragon, a living, breathing creature, and draconitas, which is the adjective associated with it, by which he means a kind of symbolic use of the idea of a dragon to represent the concept of greed. He wants a dragon that really lives and breathes fire. And you can see that from his own dragon, Smaug. Remember, he has a real dragon personality, if we can call it that, when he has that encounter with Bilbo I was just describing, you know, he says to him, he's trying to guess who Bilbo is, because he says, he knows he's invisible, but he knows he's there. He says, I don't remember smelling you before. Uh, what's your name? And we're told that Bilbo, rather carefully and sensibly, doesn't want to tell him outright who he is. Uh, instead, he rattles off a string of cryptic self-references. I am the web cutter the stinging fly, the barrel rider, the lucky number, you know, he's the 14th in the party, the ring wearer, which we're told by the narrator is the proper way to talk to a dragon if you don't want to reveal your name, which is wise, or infuriate them with a flat denial, which is also wise. <laughs> we're told that no dragon can resist the fascination of riddling talk and of wasting time trying to understand it. So we get a sense of a dragon with a personality. Smaug can be flattered. He can be deflected with riddles. But he's not stupid because, of course, he works out that Barrel Rider must mean that Bilbo's come from the nearby lake town and he flies off to have his revenge on them. As well as criticizing the Beowulf poet, then, for his depiction of a dragon, which is too much of an allegory, Tolkien took issue with the critics themselves who read the poem in that way. He was very dismissive of the concept of allegory um, and attempts of critics to try and read the Lord of the Rings in that way. And he said actually in his 1966 edition of the Lord of the Rings that the work carried no inner meaning or message. And he says, I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations and always have done since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence, I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability to the thought and experience of readers. So I think this is a useful contrast to what Lewis is doing in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And we know that these two, obviously, they read the same sources, they sat around and talked about these things together all the time in the pubs of Oxford. And there's a lovely poem, actually, which um, Lewis wrote called the alliterative meter, and it was really just intended to demonstrate the different forms of the medieval poetic form. Um, and he gave an example, one stanza is just intended to demonstrate alliterative meter, but it's, it's kind of, t it's tantalizing in its reference. We were talking of dragons, Tolkien and I, in a Berkshire bar, the big workman who had sat silent and sucked his pipe all the evening from his empty mug, with gleaming eye glanced towards us. I seen him myself, he said fiercely. <laughs> and that's it, just that tantalizing stanza, you think, tell me more. But in spite of drawing on this same material, 
they do things very differently. Remember that Lewis's dragon doesn't do what we'd expect. It did not sit up and clap its wings, nor did it shoot out a stream of flame from its mouth. It just falls over and dies. And if at this point we're hoping for this exciting encounter, remember we want a story that's engaging, that draws us in, excitement, actually we're very disappointed. But I want to suggest that there is a battle here. It's just not a test of strength or bravery. It's a battle inside Eustace's own heart, provoked by his greed for the treasure. Because as soon as he sees the treasure, he starts plotting how to steal as much of it as possible and dreaming of the lifestyle that it will give him in Narnia. Because he's very taken with the fact that there'll be no taxation in Narnia, so he can keep it all. <laughs> I don't really know what the taxation policy is in England for you know, treasure that you found on a dragon's hoard, but he seems to think it's more advantageous in Narnia. Um, but what, what happens here, I think, is that we're moving into exactly the kind of allegorical treatment of a story and a dragon that Tolkien really despised. But of course, Lewis's aims are very different. He's concerned with communicating a central idea of the Christian faith, that of sin. Eustace does battle with the greed in his own heart and he loses. And the consequence of his sin is that he himself is turned into a dragon. Sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy dragonish thoughts in his heart, he became a dragon himself. In some ways, this is a literal depiction of Matthew 6:21. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Eustace, as a dragon, would surely have offended all Tolkien's principles. To try and re-ingratiate himself with the others, he goes around lighting fires helpfully with his dragonish breath. He keeps the children warm at night by allowing them to rest on his hot sides. And then he takes them on excursions around the island flying on his back over the green slopes and the rocky heights. So here we've gone a long way from those remote northern landscapes of Beowulf and of the Volsunga saga. We're in the more comforting, familiar worlds of some of the Edwardian children's stories that use dragons. Uh, Kenneth Graham's The Reluctant Dragon, if you've ever read that story. There's a lovely Disney film based on it as well, actually. I really recommend it. And it starts, actually, with a boy who his parents despair of because he spends his whole time reading about dragons. Um, and they're saying, he's just wasting your time. What's the point? And then a dragon turns up. And he says, this is, leave it to me, parents. I can sort this out. <laughs> and you realize he's been reading all the right books. And, um, but the dragon doesn't want to fight St. George. And there's a kind of standoff because the dragon's just not interested. Um, and all there's Edith Nesbitt's Last of the Dragons, which is again a story where a dragon flies people around on their back and then eventually morphs into the first aeroplane. So it's the sort of helpful dragon kind of thing. Like, Tolkien would have hated those stories, I feel sure. But Lewis clearly liked them and thought that they were useful for what he was trying to do. He's trying to teach us something of the truth of sin. Eustace gets exactly what he wants, the treasure trove, but he can't enjoy it. He's a dragon. His first thought when he realizes that he's the dragon that he thinks he's trying to hide from is that he can get his revenge on Caspian and Edmund. I'm, now, I'm a dragon. You know, they can't do anything to me. But just as soon as that thought occurs to him, so does the realization that he's lonely. He's cut off. He longs to be back in the group, talking, laughing, and sharing things it says, sharing things. That last point, highlighting the lessening of the grip of the greed on his heart already. Eustace, as a dragon, is forced to confront his own sinfulness in a way that he wasn't able to before. The narrator says, he began to see that the others had not really been fiends at all. He began to wonder if he himself had been such a nice person as he'd always supposed. <laughs> So Eustace's transformation is a brilliant depiction of how sin fails to deliver on its promises. Neither the riches nor the power mean anything to Eustace once he's got them. But what about the theme of salvation then? So Eustace is sinful and he comes to repent of his sin. He realized that he'd behaved badly and he regretted it, but he's still a dragon. 
The story of his undragoning, as it's called by Lewis, um, is told to Edmund. He tells Edmund about it and not anyone else. And I think that's significant that he chooses Edmund because, of course, Edmund himself underwent a similar process of sin and salvation over an all-you-can-eat offer on Turkish delight in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Do you remember that scene? And Eustace tells him about how what happens to him in the night is a giant lion comes and leads him to a garden where there's a well, like a big round bath with marble steps, with water bubbling up from a spring at the bottom. And Aslan tells him to undress before he gets in. But no matter how hard Eustace scratches at the scales that cover his body, how many layers he removes, he can't be free. So he says, I started scratching myself, and the scales began coming off all over the place. And then I scratched a little deeper, and instead of just scales coming off here and there, my whole skin started peeling off beautifully, like it does after an illness or if I was a banana. In a minute or two, I just stepped out. I could see it lying there beside me, looking rather nasty. It was a most lovely feeling. So I started to go down into the well for my bathe. But just as he's about to set foot in the pool, he finds another layer of scales, just like the first one. So he starts peeling that one off too. And then the same thing happens again, and then a third time, so that he begins to despair. How many layers does he need to remove before he can get into the water? And the solution, of course, comes in the form of Aslan, who peels the scales off for him. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And then when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. You know, if you've ever picked the scab off a sore place, it hurts like bilio, but it is such fun to see it coming away. <laughs> So here, we've moved into a very different literary world. It's the world of Spencer's Fairy Queen, a poem that Lewis loved, wrote a book about, one which Tolkien hated. It offended Tolkien's philological sensibilities because Spencer created his own kind of archaic language, and so, as a result, Tolkien couldn't read it. But he would have also, I'm sure, objected to it because of its self-confessedly allegorical mode. Spencer himself described the poem as cloudily enwrapped in allegorical devices, just the kind of thing that Tolkien didn't like. And there's a dragon scene in book one of The Fairy Queen where the Red Cross Knight, who represents holiness, does a battle with a dragon in order to protect his lady, Una, who represents truth. So it's basically holiness protecting truth against this dragon. And just when everything seems lost and the Red Cross Knight is going to be overcome like all the other hopeful champions, he's overwhelmed by his injuries and the fire and the heat of the fight. But he falls back into a spring. And Spencer calls it the well of life. And then immediately he comes back out again. And suddenly he's completely restored, stronger even than before. And he conquers the dragon and wins the lady. So clearly here the well of life is representative of the Christian sacrament of baptism. The baptism purges him of his sins. It makes him stronger in his fight on behalf of truth. And Eustace's undragoning scene seems to me to draw explicitly on this episode. Here we see vividly acted out the way in which Eustace, having repented of his sins, tries to be washed clean, but cannot do it alone. No matter how many times he peels off the scales, another layer is revealed. He needs Aslan to free him process itself is painful. It goes straight into his heart, but it's the only way. And then that's not the end of the process, because he must also be washed clean through the sacrament of baptism to be fully restored. Lewis does make some changes here, though, to Spencer's more straightforwardly allegorical mode. So if you remember, the Red Cross Knight just sort of leaps back out again of the well and is immediately healed and is a conquering hero. Eustace's undragoning doesn't make him an entirely reformed character. The scales may have gone, but his old self continues to surface at times. So the narrator says, it would be nice and fairly nearly true to say that from that time Eustace was a different boy. To be strictly accurate, he began to be a different boy. He had relapses. 
There were still many days when he could be very tiresome, but most of those I shall not notice. The cure had begun. This is a very realistic account of the workings of salvation, I think. Makes it very relatable for non-Christians. Lewis himself acknowledged that he struggled with these difficulties himself, particularly when doing battle with the thoughts of self-admiration. That He says they kept popping up unbidden. Just when he thinks he's dealt with them in his meditations, prayer, up comes another. And he says it's like fighting the hydra. There seems to be no end of it. Depth under depth of self-love and self-admiration. Here we have another image of the Christian life as a battle with a mythical beast. It's a reference to the second labor of Heracles, who was tasked with slaying the many-headed hydra. And the chief difficulty with doing that is that every time you chop one head off, two grow back in its place. Lewis's constant battle to cut off the hydra's heads of self-admiration then is similar to Eustace's need to peel off the dragon scales of greed. It can't be done alone. It needs divine help. Lewis's candid assessment of the reality of his struggles with this sin is also a reminder, I think, that our attempts to share the gospel through story are most effective when we are open and real about our own struggles. We, like Eustace, may have been washed clean, but let's be honest, there are still days when we too can be tiresome. This honesty and openness about his own failings and struggles is an aspect of Lewis's writing, which I think gets to the heart of its continued relevance and why people keep coming back to him. The book that launched his career as an apologist was, of course, The Screwtape Letters. And many readers praised Lewis's spiritual insights in this book and guessed that they must have reflected many years of study in moral and ascetic theology. But he observed that such readers had forgotten that there's an equally reliable, though less creditable way of learning how temptation works. He says, my heart, I need no others, showeth me the wickedness of the ungodly. So in Screwtape, as in the Chronicles of Narnia, Lewis found a novel and fresh perspective with, from which to shine a light on human temptation and sin. I began by quoting Lewis's advice not to force the Christian elements into a story, but rather let them emerge naturally, let them bubble up, he says. And in the case of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he says that it began life as a series of disconnected images. So he saw a mental picture of his mind of a fawn in a snowy wood or a witch on a sledge. Neither of these have any Christian connection and he didn't know how the story would unfold, he says, until Aslan came bounding in and pulled itself together. So the story itself was bubbled up in that way. And he says he chose the fairy story as a form for the Narnia story because of its brevity and its severe restraint on description, digression, and analysis. This lack of internal analysis is related to another conventional feature of the fairy tale, the clear division between good and evil. You don't need any psychology in a fairy tale because someone's either good, in which case they stay good, or they're bad, in which case they stay bad. And you can see that in, say, the white witch, who remains resolutely evil to the end. But in the case of Eustace, we witness something that challenges that convention. We see repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. And even then, the change isn't simply from bad to good, because in that moment of analysis, which is so rare in the fairy tale, the narrator tells us that he continued to have relapses. If I were to ask you for a defining feature of the fairy tale, though, I suspect many of you would propose the happy ending the enchantment is broken, the wicked stepmother is defeated, the prince and princess get married, and we're promised live happily ever after. In a famous essay on fairy tales, J.R.R. Tolkien coined a term for this, called it the you catastrophe, which literally means a good catastrophe, to describe an unexpected, fortunate turn of events, what he calls a sudden and miraculous grace. 
which, while it doesn't deny the existence of the opposite, the discatastrophe, the sorrow and the failure, it does deny the universal final defeat. In such moments, Tolkien says, this sudden turn gives the reader a piercing glimpse of joy and heart's desire that for a moment passes outside the frame, rends indeed the very web of story and lets a gleam come through. We see this clearly in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, where the promise of the happy ending, the appearance of Narnia, of Aslan in Narnia, do you remember Aslan? They say Aslan has landed. The defeat of the White Witch. But it's suddenly and cruelly denied by the witch invoking her right to kill Edmund, the traitor, as permitted by the deep magic, which then leads to Aslan's self-sacrifice in his place. So everything seems lost suddenly. But of course, it's not the end of the story. The eucatastrophe is still to come. Aslan rises from the dead. The stone statues are restored to life. The witch's reign is over. The children are installed as the kings and queens of Narnia, sitting on the thrones at Ker Paravel. So here, Lewis exploits the fairy tale convention of the happy ending to present the greatest of all eucatastrophes, one in which story and history meet. The web of story is torn, and a splinter of light, or what Lewis would have called a stab of joy, breaks through. The Narnia stories offer powerful and striking ways of communicating Christian truths in ways that effectively sneak past the watchful dragons, secularism, or our own sinful natures, giving us access to real treasure, treasures in heaven, where thieves do not break in and steal, and so hence we have no need for watchful dragons. But let me just finish with the, giving the final word to Lewis. This is from the great sermon that he gave in the University Church in Oxford in 1941 called The Weight of Glory, where he warns against the grip of materialism on society and the belief that all our needs and desires can be satisfied in this world. He says, remember your fairy tales. Spells are used for breaking enchantments as well as for inducing them. And you and I have need of the strongest spell that can be found to wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness which has been laid upon us. Thank you very much. Come here, please. We, we might, I'm, I'm risking this because there is no, no way that I can stop what I'm getting ready to begin. But if we have <laughs> maybe two questions. I know they're there. <laughs> well, I will never read the Chronicles of Narnia the same again. Um, I'm so glad that this is taped as well because I'm going to listen to it about three or four more times. Um, I'll never see Eustace Scrub the same way again because it's like looking in the mirror when you look at him now, isn't it? Uh, I just thank you so much for what you have brought us. And um, we love the way the lion has been working in you, continue. He's got a book coming out on Lewis in, I'm going to say six months. I don't know. What, what? I hope so. You hope so, right. It's written. It's getting ready to go to the publisher. It, yes. Yeah, that would be, that'd be a good way to end. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the book actually is called C.S. Lewis's Oxford, and it's really uh, a study of Lewis f from the perspective of his Oxford life by somebody who is teaching the same things that he taught in the same college that he lived in. So a lot of it comes out of that academic world. 
Um, but it also is sort of structured around the different um, places that Lewis spent time in. So there's a chapter on Magdalen College, but there's also a chapter on the Eagle and Child pub. There are several pubs represented, as you can imagine. Um, and I'm going to do. There's going to be a little um, map in it, which could then so you could tour around and do it. But it turns into essentially a pub crawl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, you know, again, that's a sort of another example of him using a different kind of genre, i.e., um, science fiction to explore. I mean, I think for Lewis, exploring Christian ideas in different worlds using different genres was a really powerful way of, of, of doing that. So, for instance, in, in Perilandra, the second of those, there's a, uh, a fall or at least a temptation. So there's a, a, a world which is unfallen in which uh, a devil has arrived and somebody is sent from earth to try and prevent the fall happening. So he's just exploring these same ideas, but using different ways of doing it. So yeah, again, th those are really worthwhile um, books to read. There's another question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, so I think really it's allegory pure and simple that he objects to, where it's a kind of one-for-one -one, um, correspondence. And I suppose it's partly because his objection probably, to be fair to Tolkien, is coming more specifically out of the way that reviewers of The Lord of the Rings were looking for it, to read it as an allegory. And particularly, of course, this is just after the sort of the Second World War. Uh, where there was a real belief that that's what Tolkien was doing, was writing about the perils of you know, uh, living in a post-atomic world or, um, um, and, and very much responding directly to the war. And so he didn't want his work read in that, what he felt was a rather limiting way. And, I mean, he began writing The Lord of the Rings well before the Second World War, so it, you know, it clearly wasn't the answer. But it was more, as he says, I'm, I'm interested in history and its various applicability. And I think he probably would have said the parables had more various applicability, um, but I, I can't think of him actually explicitly ever addressing that. So I think it's more the limitations of allegory, pure, simple. He liked myth and legend and history and all those other ways of writing. Um, so yeah, I think it would, I think, and partly it's coming out of his own sense of what the Lord of the Rings is, is about and what's, what it's doing. Yeah, that's interesting. I've been reflecting about that and talking to others at the conference about it. You know, what did you read first? What got you into it? And all I can say is I remember reading the Chronicles of Narnia when I was about 11 or 12. And I'd love to know what I got out of them. <laughs> you know, like how much you get beyond the story at that stage. Um, so it's an intriguing one. I mean, that's something I, yeah, I guess it's sort of, probably the answer is that a lot of it is I just enjoyed them as stories. Um, and I, I imagine that's how most of us first come across it. And really, to me, it's, it, they're stories I've just gone back to later in life. And Lewis is somebody who, who I've sort of um, just found some different... His, his writings have been 
ones I've discovered at different points in my, in my life, I suppose. And now, being at Magdalen in a college that he was so associated with, um, you can't help but want to sort of go back and think more about him. And so that obviously has driven it sort of later in my life. But yeah, I think essentially it's the starting point is, is just reading the Narnia stories as, as, a, as a child. Yeah? Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a book that I recently come across which is all about the, the Narnia in the Bible, which gives you all of the kind of moments in the stories where biblical references are, um, you know, where Lewis is taking um, moments from the Bible itself and using them. So that'd be one, one place, but I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> really helpfully. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, beyond that, I can't really tell you. Um, but there is such a book. <laughs> so that's something. <laughs> I was able this morning, you just, I just found this so wonderful. Um, you, you, you wonder what someone who's, you, you know, so gifted in the world of academia, I mean, what's their personal life like? But I've just had such a treasure of a time hearing about the small group that he is in and his parish at Oxford, uh, home that's filled with visitors and people and students and um, a lovely wife who's a doctor um, and, and three daughters. Um, I guess that makes four against one in your home, doesn't it? And, but just, I'm just wanted to, to share, it was just a blessing to me to find not only, here's a brilliant man who writes admirable amazing books, but a wonderful, beautiful human being who's, um, who's sharing uh, the beauty of the story in a fractured world in his setting. I, I just love that. So, uh, Lord, thank you for the blessing of this time. And I, I, I pray that um, you know, whatever it is that touched us most here today, that you would bring, as Paul prays, bring to completion what you've begun and bring your beauty upon us that we might continue uh, to become undragoned in your power and your beauty and your name. We pray. Amen. <laughs>